Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a raspberry daiquiri. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a glass of rosé, and on today's episode, we're exploring the historic Eastern State Penitentiary. Eastern State Penitentiary opened on October 25th, 1829 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It was designed by John Haviland and had seven corridors of heated and skylighted cells capable of holding 500 inmates in isolation. Following the American Revolution, the United States aspired to profoundly change its public institutions and to set an example for the world in social development. This included prison design and reform. When Eastern State opened, it was the largest and most expensive public structure in the country. British architect John Haviland designed the building and used a neo-Gothic look to instill fear into those who thought of committing a crime. The prison was made up of cell wings radiating in a semicircle or full circle array from a central tower whence the prison could be kept under constant surveillance. The design for the prison, which Haviland devised, became known as the hub-and-spoke plan, which consisted of an octagonal center connected by corridors to seven radiating single-story cell blocks. The halls of the prison were designed to feel similar to a church. Prisoners entered and left the cell blocks through metal doors that were covered by a heavy wooden door to filter out noise. The halls were designed to have the feel of a church. This design is related to penance and ties to the religious inspiration of the prison. There were rectangular openings in the cell wall through which food and work materials could be passed to the prisoner, as well as peepholes for guards to observe prisoners without being seen. The cells were made of concrete with a single glass skylight representing the quote-unquote eye of God, suggesting to the prisoners that God was always watching them. Outside the cell was an individual area for exercise enclosed by high walls so prisoners could not communicate. Each cell had a faucet with running water over a flush toilet as well as curved pipes along part of one wall which served as central heating during the winter months where hot water would be run through the pipes to keep the cells reasonably heated. The building had running water before the White House did. Toilets were remotely flushed twice a week by the guards of the cell block. This was done in the hope that prisoners would not be able to share messages with one another. By the time the third cell block was completed, the prison was already overcrowded, so the subsequent cell blocks were two stories. Eastern State was thought to be the world's first true penitentiary. The penitentiary was intended not simply to punish, but to move the criminal towards spiritual reflection and change. Proponents of the system believe strongly that the criminals expose and silence to thoughts of their behavior and the ugliness of their crimes would become genuinely penitent, which is where the word penitentiary comes from. Nicknamed the Pennsylvania system or separate system, inmates would be confined separately from each other. At the time, this form of punishment was thought to be most effective. This greatly differed from the popular Auburn system or New York system, which allowed prisoners to be subjected to physical punishment and forced silent labor. The inmates lived in complete isolation with the Bible as their only possession and chores like shoemaking, gardening, and weaving to occupy their time. Exercise time for each prisoner was synchronized so that no two prisoners next to each other would be out at the same time. When a prisoner left their cell, an accompanying guard would wrap a hood around his head to prevent them from being recognized by other prisoners. Prisoners kept in isolation for long periods of time do not become penitent and reflective. Instead, they suffer negative mental health impact. Guards and counselors of the facilities designed a variety of physical and psychological torture regimens for various infractions, including dousing prisoners and freezing water outside during winter months, chaining their tongues to their wrists, 
in a fashion such that struggling against the change could cause the tongue to tear, strapping prisoners into chairs with tight leather restraints for days on end, and putting the worst behaved prisoners in a pit called the quote-unquote hole. An underground cell block dug under cell block 14, where they would have no light, no human contact, and little food for as long as two weeks. Guards rarely faced punishment for abusing inmates. Though no one was ever put to death at Eastern State, cell block 15 served as death row. A debate would later grow about the effectiveness and compassion of solitary confinement and the use of solitary confinement ended in 1913. Charles Williams was the very first prisoner at Eastern State. He was sentenced to two years confinement with labor for stealing a watch, a gold seal, and a gold king. Most of the early prisoners were petty criminals incarcerated for various robberies and theft charges, and the first-time offenders often served two years. Eastern State was the most famous prison in the world at the time. It became a tourist destination and was even visited by Babe Ruth and President Andrew Jackson. The prisoners themselves were not allowed to have visits with family or friends during their stay until the late 1800s. As many as 1,800 prisoners were serving time at Eastern State at once though it was meant to hold far less. Here are some of the notable prisoners. In 1924, Pennsylvania Governor Gifford Pinchot allegedly sentenced Pep, the cat-murdering dog, an actual dog, to a life sentence at Eastern State. Pep allegedly murdered the governor's wife's cherished cat. Prison records reflect that Pep was assigned an inmate number, number C2559, which is seen in his mugshot. However, the reason for Pep's incarceration remains a subject of some debate. A contemporary newspaper article reported that the governor donated his own dog to the prison to increase inmate morale. Al Capone, Chicago's most famous mob boss, spent eight months at Eastern State from 1929 to 1930. He was arrested for carrying a concealed deadly weapon, and this was Capone's first prison sentence. His time in Eastern State was spent in relative luxury. His cell on the Park Avenue block had fine furniture, oriental rugs, and a cabinet radio. The restored cell can still be seen today. And lastly, there is Willie Sutton, one of the most famous bank robbers in American history. Slick Willie spent 11 years at Eastern State Penitentiary. In 1945, Sutton, along with 11 other prisoners, escaped from Eastern State in a prison dug tunnel that went almost 100 feet underground. Sutton was recaptured just minutes later. Over the course of his criminal career, Sutton is credited with over 50 bank robberies, three successful escapes from prison, and over 30 years served behind bars. I believe he also has a quote where he says, you know, someone had asked him, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is, which I will give him credit. That is funny. (laughs) Many prisoners passed time by crafting things like jewelry and wood carvings that they would later sell, playing sports, joining clubs, writing for the prison newspaper, or attending classes. Inmates were allowed to take part in religious services, watch movies, and attend vaudeville performances. Concerts from within the prison were even broadcast locally. During World War I, the female inmates knitted sweaters for soldiers and raised funds for a Red Cross ambulance. Many prisoners asked for work but were at the mercy of the guards, and early 1900s Pennsylvania law dictated that only one-tenth of all prisoners at an institution could work. Until the mid-1900s, prison officials lived in the front administration buildings of the prison. Some even let inmates babysit their children. Warden Robert McKenty's daughter even got married at the prison. As time went on, the media fueled the idea that a large maximum security prison in the middle of a city was potentially unsafe and illogical, and a riot in 1961 led to the conversation of closing the prison. In 1965, Eastern State Penitentiary was designated as a National Historic Landmark. 
1971, the prison officially closed. A majority of prisoners and guards were transferred to Greaterford Prison, about 31 miles northwest of Eastern State. The city of Philadelphia purchased the property with the intention of redeveloping it. The site had several proposals, including a mall and a luxury apartment complex surrounded by the old prison walls. The site was abandoned for many years, and in 1988, the Eastern State Penitentiary Task Force successfully petitioned Mayor Wilson Good to stop redevelopment. The facility was kept in quote-unquote preserved ruin, meaning no significant renovation or restoration was attempted until 1991, when the Pew Charitable Trust provided funding so that stabilization and preservation efforts could begin. In 1994, Eastern State opened to the public for its history tours. It still operates as a museum and historic site that is open year-round. The museum also features art installations, special exhibits, and a haunted house during Halloween time. In 2017, Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site adopted a new mission statement with a focus on interpreting the legacy of criminal justice reform. An average of 220,000 visitors come to the prison each year, and it's estimated that 75,000 to 85,000 men, women, and children served time at Eastern State throughout its history. Del, what are your thoughts on Eastern State, and have you ever visited? I have not visited yet, but I mean, definitely after hearing more about it, I would want to. It's relatively close. I think that I like the mission of it, of the Pennsylvania system. I just think that the implementation was definitely not as good as it could be. I think that humans are social creatures. And even when you are serving time for a crime, that still needs to be recognized. I know that we're going to talk a bit later about uh, solitary confinement and the pitfalls with that. I do think that it's very interesting that the building had running water before the White House did. I think it just goes to show that engineers and plumbers are the best and they definitely wanted this prison to be an example for others to follow. That includes making sure they have all the technological upgrades to it. This prison is definitely better than the New York system. And when I think of that, I think of like Rikers. It's better than that. But I think that at this point, it serves more use as a museum and kind of a cultural site than it does as an actual prison. Mostly because, in general, I believe that we should be reducing the number of prisons, not keeping them, especially one that is unable to comfortably house as many people that may be housed there. What are your thoughts on it, and have you ever been? I have been. I went on a class trip in high school, actually, and I've been wanting to go back for a while now. I do think it's really fascinating to hear... About the prison's like design and like the culture at the prison. Like you said, Del, it's <laughs> crazy that it had running water before the White House did. Like, who would think that? And I agree with what you had said. I think the Pennsylvania system really had good intentions, but I think they were probably lacking some like psychological knowledge of like you were saying that people are social creatures and they need contact and you know this like forced isolation is not going to be the best thing it's interesting to see we'll talk about this a little later but it's interesting to see how some of these issues within prisons i mean that have been happening since the 1800s are still prevalent today like the abuse of inmates it's horrifying to hear some of the stuff that they did. I mean, dousing like cold water on people in the winter and then like make doing something so that their tongue can tear. That's like medieval times, like barbaric stuff, if you ask me. And of course, like, you know, there's probably like no oversight then, especially compared to 
I would say like little oversight that there is now. And it's fascinating too, how quickly it became so overcrowded. I mean, we said that it was supposed to hold 500 people and it could hold 18. It ended up holding like 1800 people on average. That is wild. And again, we have tons of prison overcrowding to this day in the country. What I find most fascinating and interesting, like I was saying, is the prison culture. I don't know what exactly morale is like in like prisons today, but I think it's good to have the inmates be able to keep busy with crafts and woodworking and then to join clubs and play sports. And the fact that they had like a prison newspaper and they also had a prison magazine at one point, I think is so interesting. And I would like to know how common stuff like that is now, because it really, you know, it is a skill and it's a way for the inmates to communicate with each other and maybe heal a little bit. I know towards the end of the prison's lifetime, they were also doing like voluntary therapy groups amongst the inmates. And they were apparently very successful and well attended. And like I said, it was voluntary. So I'm hoping that was helpful for people. For anyone that does go, I think <laughs> my favorite story is definitely of Pep the dog. and. <laughs> the uh i guess the mystery around why he was there because i had always heard that it was that the dog had murdered had killed a cat but the fact that he could have been donated i think is also interesting there's a lot of modern day programs where inmates look at, look after animals that can then go on to get adopted and it's supposed to be very helpful for the incarcerated people so that was the reasoning he was definitely onto something and Again, for people that go there, you have to see the Al Capone cell because it needs to be seen to be believed. It does not look like a prison cell. It looks like something out of like a beautiful like Victorian mansion. We'll try to post some pictures of this stuff for sure. And then with Willie Sutton, you can see where like the tunnel was dug and it is mind blowing also to think that it went almost a hundred feet underground and that these people like were able to crawl out of it. I'm claustrophobic. I would never be able to do it. I'd be stuck in there. (laughs) It's cool to see. It's cool how so much is preserved. And I don't know if when I was there, so this would have been after I was there when they changed the mission to focus a lot on criminal justice reform. But I think it's really interesting and a really good move for them to do. Why do you think so many people want to visit a prison, Del? Like even like we were saying back then in the 18, 1900s, it was like a tourist attraction in the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, I think that people have always been fascinated seeing something that is different than their typical situation. Most people will never see the inside of a prison, right? Because most people don't commit crimes. So I think this is a way to really fulfill that curiosity that people have in a safe manner where they know like, okay, I'm going to be good and, you know, get to go home at the end of this. And also it's connections to other cultural people such as Al Capone, I think also push people to want to learn more about it. And when it comes to certain locations, the best way to learn about it is to actually visit it and, you know, tour it and be around all the different components. What do you think? I think it's definitely that morbid curiosity like you touched on. And frankly, like back then, there weren't like as many ways to entertain yourself as there are now. So like, this is a little different, but people would go to public executions and stuff. So I feel like, you know, visiting a prison is like within the same realm. I think today too, I think it is like a little bit of that like morbid curiosity. Also, like... I mean, it is a museum now, so people want to visit museums, but it's a very unique museum. Like, it it is still the prison. You still, you can kind of feel that when you're there. It really is like a fortress. Um, And I'm glad we've kept it preserved because the U.S. is not necessarily known for preserving a lot of our history. You know, you can argue this is like a good or bad part of our history, but it's there and there's definitely something to 
to learn from it. I definitely agree. I think that hopefully as time goes on, we continue that and continue to know that for as good as history books are in teaching individuals about what happens, nothing can really replace being able to be on site somewhere and explore and kind of walk the grounds that historical figures have walked prior. To give more context on the importance of Eastern State, we wanted to give a brief overview of the history of prisons in the United States. In colonial times, courts and magistrates would impose punishments, including fines, forced labor, public restraint, flogging, maiming, and death, with sheriffs detaining some defendants awaiting trial. The use of confinement as a punishment in itself, which originally seen as a more humane alternative to capital and corporal punishment, especially among Quakers in Pennsylvania. Most 18th century prisons were simply large holding pens. Groups of adults and children, men and women, and petty thieves and murderers sorted out their own affairs behind locked doors. Imprisonment began to replace other forms of criminal punishment in the United States just before the American Revolution. Following the revolution, many states updated laws and less crimes were considered capital crimes, creating a need for other forms of punishment, which led to incarceration of longer periods of time. Sociologist Ashley Rubin said the existing punishment just weren't working to deter crime, deter crime. A big concern at the time was that the existing punishments were actually causing more crime. The fear was that people would go to an execution and get bloodlust and want to go kill people themselves. Prison advocates argued that people would hear scary stories about prison and the thought of being locked away from friends and families would terrify them into never committing a crime. Simultaneously, there was this movement to reform jails because the conditions were just horrible, grotesque even. There was a lot of fighting and corruption, and they were hot spots for disease. Those ideas kind of came together, the desire for a new type of punishment and the need to reform the jails and pave the way for prisons as we know them. As the population grew in the eastern U.S. during the 1800s, Americans favored reform. They had ideas that rehabilitating prisoners to become law-abiding citizens was the next step. They needed to change the prison system's functions. Jacksonian American reformers hoped that changing the way they developed the institutions would give the inmates the tools needed to change. Auburn State Prison became the first prison to implement the rehabilitative idea. The function of the prison was to isolate, teach obedience, and use labor for the means of production through the inmates. This was later known as the Auburn system, which we did talk about. The Auburn system eventually prevailed over the Pennsylvania system, likely due to its lesser cost. Incarcerated people across the country face many forms of abuse and punishment as a means of control or in retaliation for not working. Little was done at the time to address this abuse of power. The use of convict labor remained popular nationwide throughout the post-war period. An 1885 national survey reported that 138 institutions employed over 53,000 inmates in industries who produced goods valued at $28.8 million. By the late 1890s, eugenics programs were enjoying a quote-unquote full-blown renaissance in American prisons and institutions for the mentally ill with leading physicians, psychologists, and wardens as proponents. Prisons became laboratories for studying eugenics, psychology, human intelligence, medicine, drug treatment, genetics, and birth control. The form and function of prison systems in the U.S. has continued to change as a result of political and scientific developments, as well as notable reform movements. But the status of penal incarceration as the primary mechanism for criminal punishment has remained the same since its first emergence in the wake of the American Revolution. While some advocates, organizations, and policymakers have focused on improving conditions, 
within prison in recent years, the isolation of prison facilities and the staff who work within them make wholesale change a slow and difficult process. Del, any thoughts on this brief history of prisons in the U.S.? So one thing that always stood out to me was how important the Quakers were and are in terms of why our prison system looks the way it does. And they definitely came at it from a place of we want to make sure that we are punishing people for the crimes that we're, uh, that they are committing. but. We also want to make sure that we are not permanently damaging people as they serve time. It was definitely that thought of we need to not only think about what's going to happen to the incarcerated while they're in jail, but are they going to be okay afterwards? Are they going to be fit to return to society. And I think the Quakers definitely introduced that. For me, the Auburn uh, system, yeah, it's cheaper and it is the way that most prisons are set up. I just don't like the isolation element of it. Again, humans are meant to be social. Humans are meant to interact. And I think in terms of being able to reintegrate into society afterwards, the Auburn system just puts inmates at a severe disadvantage at this point. And one of the things that definitely needs to be done is finding a way to have respect for prisoners' rights as well as maintaining order. And I don't think we have that yet. And I'll be curious to see kind of what the next system uh, of prisons is going to look like, especially with the increased privatization of prisons. I'm not surprised that eugenics programs were fully instituted into prisons. Prisons have a pretty racist history and they it continues until present day, I do wonder what kind of the modern day eugenics and prisons look like. Uh, I'll be interested in kind of reading like research papers related to that. Hopefully prisons continue to adapt and change in a more positive way away from privatization and just making sure that we are using inmates prison time to make sure that they are ready for reintegration back into society. What are your thoughts on them? One of the things that has always stood out to me, and I feel like I might have learned this at Eastern State all those years ago on a class trip, was that a lot of these prisons were just like holding cells where everybody was thrown together. Like no matter what crime you committed, no matter what like your age or gender was, everyone was just like in there together, which I think is like really frightening to think about, especially like in regards to women and children. We already know that there's, in our last episode, we talked about adults and children being in prisons together and, you know, rates of abuse and sexual assault. So I'm sure stuff, similar stuff was happening all those years ago. Another thing that really stuck out to me researching this was just how common like prison labor was. I guess I thought maybe it was like a more recent thing, but to hear like all the money people have been making off of inmates for centuries is crazy. To me that it kind of goes with what you were saying about like private prisons and like, where are we going with that? Cause I feel like that is something that's gotten a lot more conversation in the last maybe like 10 or so years. So it's inter- who knows where it'll go. Like you were saying, I know that there is a lot of, a lot of call for reform. I think COVID-19 has brought that out too. I know that many people within prisons, staff and inmates were becoming really sick Because of this overcrowding, you know, like people really couldn't isolate and it just kind of exacerbated an already not good situation for people in there. It's like I was kind of saying earlier too, it's interesting how like not a ton has really changed in some regards in like 
when looking at the negative aspects of prisons. I do think reform needs to happen. I don't I don't know how it will happen or what is the best because the staff there need to be safe. But like you were saying, these prisoners do have rights, whether people want to accept that or not. They can't just be experimented on willingly. Although I know people to this day still think that is what should happen in prisons. And of course, it is like you were saying, it's interesting to see like what will the next generation of prisons look like? Because I'm sure many of you know the U.S. is really known for having such a high prison population. It seems like more prisons are needed because of that. But then reform calls for less prisons, which I would like to see. I'd just like to see less people incarcerated in general. It's like a longstanding issue that will take a lot of time. So now we're going to transition and talk about solitary confinement. Many 18th century English philanthropists proposed solitary confinement as a way to rehabilitate inmates morally. Since at least 1740, philanthropic thinkers touted the use of penal solitude for two primary purposes, to isolate prison inmates from the moral contagion of other prisoners and to jumpstart their spiritual recovery. The philanthropists found solitude far superior to hard labor, which only reached the convict's worldly self, failing to get at the underlying spiritual causes of crime. The first experiment in solitary confinement in the United States begins at the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. But like we mentioned, The use of solitary confinement ended at Eastern State in the early 1900s. After Charles Dickens visited Eastern State and saw inmates held in solitary confinement, he said that it is, quote, worse than any torture of the body. The system is rigid, strict, and hopeless solitary confinement, and I believe in its effects to be cruel and wrong, end quote. In 1934, the federal government opened Alcatraz in San Francisco Bay to house the nation's worst criminals. A few dozen were kept in D-Block, the prison's solitary confinement hallway. One cell in particular was called The Hole, a room of bare concrete except for a hole in the floor. Although most inmates only spent a few days in the hole, some spent years on D-Block. The most famous inmate on D-Block was Robert Stroud, known as the Birdman of Alcatraz, who spent six years there. A 1962 movie about Stroud and subsequent media reports on the conditions on D-Block made solitary confinement a fixture of the American imagination for the first time. In 1983, two correctional officers at a Marion, Illinois prison were murdered by inmates in two separate incidents on the same day. The Warren at the time put the prison in what he called quote-unquote permanent lockdown. It was the first prison in the country to adopt 23-hour-a-day cell isolation and no communal yard time for all inmates. Inmates were no longer allowed to work, attend educational programs, or eat in a cafeteria. Within a few years, several other states also adopted permanent lockdown at existing facilities. In 1989, California built Pelican Bay, a new prison built solely to house inmates in isolation. Inmates would spend 22 and a half hours a day inside an 8 by 10 foot cell. The other one and a half hours were spent alone in a small concrete exercise pen. In the 1990s, similar prisons were developed across the country. In 1995, a federal judge found conditions at Pelican Bay in California, quote, may well hover on the edge of what is humanely tolerable, end quote. And this was discussed in the Madrid versus Gomez case. But the judge ruled that there was no constitutional basis for the courts to shut down the unit or to alter it substantially. He said the court must defer to the states about how best to incarcerate offenders. 
On a given day in 2019, an estimated 55,000 to 62,500 people had spent the previous 15 days in solitary confinement in state and federal prisons, often in cells smaller than a parking space. Correctional officials often defend their frequent use of solitary confinement as an effective means of maintaining order and deterring violence and gang activity. Recent studies show that time spent in solitary confinement shortens lives even after release. Solitary confinement goes by many names, including special housing units, administrative segregation, disciplinary segregation, and restrictive housing, but the conditions are generally the same. 22 to 24 hours per day spent alone in a small cell. The practice is widespread in jails, prisons, ICE detention centers, and juvenile facilities, and people are often sent to solitary for vague reasons or minor offenses. Black and Hispanic people who are already overrepresented in correctional facilities are further overrepresented in solitary confinement. Solitary isn't just used for short periods of time either. Many people are confined without human interaction for years and sometimes even decades. Placing people in solitary confinement adds an extra burden of stress that has been shown to cause permanent changes to people's brains and personalities. The part of the brain that plays a major role in memory has been shown to physically shrink after long periods without human interaction. And since humans are naturally social, depriving people of the inability to socialize can cause quote-unquote social pain, which researchers define as, quote, the feelings of hurt and distress that come from negative social experiences, such as social deprivation, exclusion, rejection, or loss, end quote. Even though people in solitary confinement comprise only 6 to 8% of the total prison population, they account for approximately half of those who die by suicide. Even if someone doesn't enter solitary with a mental health condition, it's possible for them to develop a specific psychiatric syndrome due to the effects of isolation. The irreparable damages caused by solitary confinement have led the United Nations to consider solitary torture when used for longer than 15 consecutive days. Del, what are your thoughts on when and how solitary confinement should be used? I do not support the use of solitary confinement in any way. I think that, like you just described, it is torture. It's a type of torture similar to white noise torture where you are isolating someone and causing psychological harm. It reminds me of Khalif Browder. Anytime we talk about solitary confinement, where he was released from jail, he wasn't able to overcome the pain, the psychological pain caused by being in solitary confinement for almost three years. I don't understand why the prison system continues to use something that they know is harmful. Like they know it's harmful to people. They know it makes it harder for them to reintegrate into society. It makes it harder for them to get the rehabilitative services while in jail. Yeah, humans are, like you said, social creatures. Even if it's not all day conversations, just being able to hear someone else's voice, you know, being able to have a brief conversation goes a long way. Just because you committed a crime doesn't mean that anyone has the right to take your humanity away. They're taking your freedom away. Okay. But you are still human. You still have rights. And one of prisoners' human rights is to maintain their sanity while they are serving their sentence. What about you? It definitely can be torturous. Um, These statistics, like the research that's done, is shocking, I think, to hear about the effects that it can have for people's lives. It's not something that goes away. I don't know if I'm fully against 
using solitary confinement, I would say it shouldn't be more used for more than like two days, though. I mean, to hear that people are on it for years at a time, I don't know how anyone can morally be okay with that. And I think part of why they do use it is just like a set it and forget it. Like, who cares about the people that are incarcerated here? Like, really is like the definition of just letting them rot, which is you know, a critique of prisons that people are just like left there to rot. And I can understand where these officials are coming from saying, well, it gives us more control, especially if people are like being violent with each other. And I would say like, that's really the only excuse. Uh, The only reason I would say to put someone in solitary confinement is if like they're starting fights or being violent with people to hear that, you know, no surprise, I'm sure that black and Hispanic people are in solitary confinement more is not surprising. It's upsetting. And then to hear that it's like for arbitrary reasons, a lot of people that get thrown in, I feel like it goes to show like the issue of, I guess, the power dynamics within prisons about like what we've been saying, these guards torture people for retaliating, not listening to them for not, you know, fully being under their control. And it's not right to do that. Again, prisoners do have rights, they should have rights. Um, And I feel like solitary confinement does go against that in many situations. There is like a lot more mental health issues that can come from it. I know like PTSD, anger, depression, anxiety. I'm sure that's no surprise hearing about it. And like we were talking about with like Alcatraz, the Shawshank Redemption, I think that there, there's like a big scene with solitary confinement and how just horrifying it is in that movie. I would like to see less of it. It's upsetting to hear that there's like specific facilities just being built with that as the only intent. To me, that is a waste. I do think what we were saying with Eastern State, I feel like prisoners should have should be allowed to work have some kind of recreation um, with other individuals and to you know be exposed to classes and whatnot I think it's a disgrace to have these how multi-million dollar facilities I'm sure be used to like I was saying just let people rot for 22 to 24 hours a day frankly I think more people should be upset by that I absolutely agree. I, they say, don't attribute malice to what can be attributed to ignorance. But at this point, I firmly believe that if it was any other group of people and not prisoners, people would care more about what is happening and the effects that it's having on individuals. But because it's prison, people have this weird expectation that it must be bad. You know, it must be the worst place ever. And it's like, you can have a balance between making sure that it's not like the four seasons and making sure that it's fit for humans, that it's habitable. Yeah, it's absolutely a nuanced conversation. And I'm glad you pointed that out. Because like you said, we're not advocating for prisons to be like the life of luxury like Al Capone had. But to for these people to be treated like people. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Eastern State Penitentiary. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode. As always, stay safe.